on Dana's panel today, um, we have uh, two gentlemen who will, uh, who will be able to give us a lot of insight, I know. Uh, the first is Andres Sokol, Vice President and CTO at IBM US Federal. Andres is responsible for IBM's industry solution technology strategy in support of the US Federal customer. He's the current chair of the Open Group Governing Board, the vice chair of the Open Group Trusted Technology Forum, which those of you who were here yesterday would have heard more about. Chair. Oh, well, it says vice chair on here. Okay, my apologies. Chair of that. Um, and uh, is also instrumental in the Open Certified architecture, uh, Architect Standard, which uh, was one of the first professions that we had before uh, data science. Uh, the other gentleman is just passing, uh, uh, passing behind me there, uh, Gary Brandt, Senior Product Manager at Microfocus, focused on advanced analytics and machine learning. Gary has over 20 years of experience in the IT industry in the areas of enterprise scale, business solutions, and IT operations. So welcome, Gary. Welcome, Andres. And uh, over to you, Dana. I can have a seat and rest my voice. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Being here today. You know, the IT department in organizations, both public and private, has been tasked with supporting data analytics and data marts and management and big data over the years, and that has borne great fruit for organizations across the enterprise, whether it's finance or marketing or procurement and supply chain. <clears throat> but we're now at an era where the complexity and the speed at which things happen in the IT operations organization is outstripping some of the older methods, particularly with, with uh, it being just a legacy environment with the advent of more and more cloud, and Gartner just came out this week and said that cloud uh, spending is gonna go up by 17.5% in 2019 alone <coughs> uh, to uh, $214 billion, <coughs> excuse me. So cloud is obviously uh, well into uh, an adoption mode that's very rapid, and, and the complexity is spinning up as well because it's not just public cloud, it's private cloud, and therefore hybrid cloud, and and multi-cloud because organizations, whether they know it or not or have control over it or not, are doing uh, an awful lot of business across multiple public cloud providers, the hyperscalers. So the point in time that we're at now is bringing perhaps some of the tools that IT has used to help other parts of the enterprise and apply that back into itself internally to start to use data monitoring even uh, machine learning and ultimately artificial intelligence to make the task of managing, optimizing, and automating the IT operations just as fruitful as it's been for a data-driven organization across the line of business units. So we have two gentlemen here to help us sort through this. We're gonna try to figure out what's the problem, what's the solution, and how other organizations can start to make the IT operations data-driven as well. So with that, um, let's start to scope out the size of the problem. Gary, when you look at organizations that Microfocus is dealing with and that you come across in your travels, uh, how big of a problem is it, this sprawl, if you will, this heterogeneity across multiple cloud models for organizations? Uh, to what degree are we into a, a real complexity mess here? Yeah, so Dana, you know, analytics is, pervasive everywhere, and as, as organizations are going through their digital transformation and actually creating digital services, you know, they're looking to cloud, they're looking to different <coughs> models, uh, economic models to, to deploy and, and get business value. That comes with uh, a cost and, and complexity as, you know, I think everybody knows, you know, the, the technology stacks today to deliver business solutions is, is complex, and as we move into the cloud arena, that complexity just expands tremendously. So um, getting a kind of holistic picture of a business solution or a digital service uh, becomes very you know, daunting to, to a lot of customers. So the, the techniques and our traditional ways of monitoring and applying analytics in a, in an internal or you know, an on-prem solution um, are, are typically, you know, try to extend to, into the cloud, but they tend to uh, have, you know, some challenges of, them, of, them, of themselves because of the, the amount of data that gets generated 
in these complex solutions. So being able to um, use the data that gets generated from an operational um, management perspective, uh, we can really turn to the instrumentation and, and using data that gets generated from uh, cloud infrastructure or cloud applications or microservices or whatever, the, you know, whatever you're building and deploying into the, into the cloud environments and bring that back and, and make sense of it in, in ways that give better insight to, to optimize how we're using the cloud and, and to ultimately uh, reduce the costs around, uh, around managing uh, such environments. Yeah, Andrash, my first impression is that this isn't as big of a problem in the public sector because they often are budgeted on a uh, OPEX basis and they're often making big contracts. But maybe I'm mistaken, is sprawl and the complexity of cloud use and adoption in the IT operations in the public sector just as uh, messy as it is in the public uh, private sector right now? Well, in some ways, the public sector has been ahead the federal community ahead of the adoption curve with respect to cloud. Our first federal CIO, you know, basically mandated the cloud first uh, approach and really started pulling in, you know, the investors and venture capitalists and eventually building up the standards for what it meant to participate in cloud within the federal government space. So, um, but, um, you know, is there, I guess your question is, is there complexity and there's, is there sprawl? Let me, let me tell you about, uh, we did a survey and um, about 20% uh, of the organization's IT infrastructure, whether it be public sector or private, um, has moved to cloud. When you look at that 20%, um, it's usually low hanging fruit, easy lift and shift stuff, um, but it's given everybody um, essentially a good understanding of the upside and the downside to cloud. Uh, it's certainly not the uh, panacea of savings that everybody thought it would be. It is essential um, and it, everything will move to cloud, but it's gonna actually come in probably a hybrid form for many years to come. And most importantly, 85% of all of the CIOs say that it's gonna be in a multi-cloud approach. Uh, is there a risk that the move to cloud happens so rapidly and without sufficient monitoring and oversight that it starts to subvert the benefits? So when you ask a number of organizations, why do you move to cloud? It often has to do with speed. It has to do with maybe better security, potentially lower costs. But it seems to me that if you're running an organization where you don't know who's doing what where, that your governance and security can suffer, that your costs can spin out of control, that the time to market for your products and services could suffer. How risky is it going to cloud without sufficient monitoring and management, Gary? Yeah, we, we see this in a lot of the customers that we work with, um, in that monitoring or that, that operational aspect tends to be the final mile, um, especially driven by organizations that have adopted um, a DevOps model or you know, agile where they have continuous delivery and they wanna get um, the value out there quickly, uh, but they, they don't, um, you know, based on maturity of the operations team, uh, may not think um, fully ahead and, and plan out the, the operational aspects of it. So yeah, it, it definitely is a problem. Um, and you know, one, one of the ways to, to comment that is uh, through ways to work with uh, operations or development teams early on and uh, build in uh, monitoring in the in the development process. So part of that that um, that continuous delivery, continuous um, integration models and methodologies, they can uh, bring that that instrumentation into the cloud along with their code uh, to to keep pace with the uh, the rate that they're delivering value into the cloud. Mm -hmm. Andras, uh, is this too much of a good thing? The cloud, the multi-cloud, the hybrid cloud, and do we run the risk of subverting the values uh, as a business outcome when we don't man manage, monitor, and begin to automate? No, I think that uh, even Gartner recently said that um, enterprise architecture in the cloud and digital transformation architecture is the wave of the future. And I think since everybody has figured out you know, how to at least understand the value proposition of cloud. The next phase is this kind of enterprise architecture piece 
which is really cloud-focused, agile, and takes into consideration the vendor offerings that come as services from different CSPs. Um, so I think that it will be measured, and I think it will be hybrid, and I think the high value assets will end up staying on prem in a hybrid cloud environment. Cloud, just the word cloud, no longer kind of elicits the idea of putting everything up in the cloud. It's more about the cloud technologies that are pervasive now. Just a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, I know lunch is coming soon on the heels of this discussion and you might not want to linger too long, but if you do have questions, please add them to Slido and we will get to them at the end. All right, let's go back to the data uh, situation. So even though we're looking at cloud now as a consumption model rather than a destination, when we think about all of the places that data and apps and services are running, even as we consume them in a more common uh, format, um, how do we know where that data is? How do we track it? So Gary, um, have the maturity and capabilities of the data, the metadata about what's going on in the workloads, uh, how they're being operated in per terms of performance and, and price in terms of economics, is that lagging? Are we still now able to gather all the information across a cloud spectrum that we were if we had this all running in a legacy environment on, on, on premises? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I, I think some of this, um, it, it, it happens in pockets, but um, I, th I think what it comes down to is when, when you're talking about a digital service or something that you're putting in the cloud, you know, what is the, the, the definition of, of what you're, you're monitoring or what, what you're trying to um, ensure stays available and is performing properly? And if you look at the digital service, right, the scope of that might be beyond just one cloud piece, especially if you're doing a multi-cloud type of deployment, or if you're hybrid and you have components of that on the back end. You know, for an example, if you think of like a, a travel service, you know, you go to a travel service, there's a lot of different functions. And if you're, you know, you may, you may have a booking part, you may have, you know, a search part, you may have um, additional services to, to do, you know, add-on capabilities, there might be an expense part. All of those things might be different applications, but if you're defining your digital service as a travel capability, how are you measuring the end user experience, which I think is gonna be important regardless of the cloud or technology stack that you use. So whether it's your, your SLA around that digital service will really determine um, the, you, how, how, how much how many points that you need to extract data and how many points do you need to have this cross-domain view of that digital service in order to ensure the, the levels of performance or the levels of user experience are, are satisfactory for that digital experience. Mm -hmm. So I think in pockets, <coughs> to answer your question, I think they're in pockets uh, for small uh, applications, there is, um, you know, there, there, there's kind of good coverage, but I think when you look holistically at you know, or really ask yourself, what are you trying to measure from an end user experience or from an SLA perspective? Then you may find gaps that still need to be filled. Gaps can be a problem. Uh, if you don't know what you don't know, you're gonna run into trouble, whether it's in governance, whether it's in operational integrity, whether it's in costs overrun. Uh, Andras, over the course of IT management history, we've had red light, green light, we've had agents, then we had agent less, uh, then we had using search to go into log files to pull out uh, inferences and uh, uh, start to be proactive about when things will go wrong rather than reacting after they go wrong. Are we losing some of that proactive capability when it comes to cloud, multi-cloud, uh, hybrid cloud? How do we stay in front of the equation when it comes to performance integrity when we've got such a vast heterogeneity across where workloads and data reside these days? Yeah, that's a really good question and there is a, an evolving approach to that problem because there is a realization that you know you have all these m multiple vendors, multiple clouds, you're going to be using the services from these multiple clouds, and then the question becomes what is the programming model that you're using? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the programming model is based on this concept of microservices, kind of next generation SOA, the underlying technology that everybody is adopting across all of the cloud vendors is Kubernetes and containers and, uh, and being able to orchestrate. 
And on top of that, you have Helm and all, all these other you know, standards that are used to monitor, manage, deploy, and maintain microservices across a hybrid cloud infrastructure and to be able to move applications seamlessly using containers from one cloud environment, whether it be your hybrid personal cloud or to another vendors. And so I, uh, I see the, the new products that are evolving out there and the new capabilities based on these standards. And uh, I think it, that we're gonna get our arms around it. Now, it, it's gonna require some expertise. You know, do you understand how to build a microservice application and can you architect it efficiently? And um, all of these questions are gonna be asked of you as you go forward in your, in your multi-cloud strategy. So perhaps uh, we've talked a lot already about the role of the data scientist and how that's changing. Is the role of the IT operations person changing too, Gary, when we think about them having to be aware of economics of cloud services? The, thousands of SKUs about these cloud uh, services you can consume from the various hyperscalers. Uh, how do I move from one cloud to another if the, uh, the SLAs require that or my, uh, my finance officer who's trying to get a better deal is, is requesting doing arbitrage between cloud services? That doesn't sound like IT operations. That sounds like procurement or finance or operations. What's going to change from the people perspective when it comes to getting a better handle over cloud management across the spectrum of cloud capabilities and options. Yeah, yeah all great points. Um, it, it's a, uh, w when, you, when you look at the, um, the sort of the, uh, w what's most important to uh, a director of cloud or um, a vice president of, of um, an IT organization or, or somebody who uh, ultimately has to be accountable the number one concern they have is, you know, what value do, am I providing to the business? So um, being able to demonstrate that value uh, is, is key. And a big dimension of that is cost. Uh, so as um, from a people perspective, you know, most IT organizations either have flat or declining budgets overall uh, and are expected to do more with less. So, um, as you know, one, one danger in, in uh, bringing in or expanding out to the cloud is when you're working with you know, different models and different uh, technology stacks, uh, you, you natively have to have some level of expertise or some level of understanding of how to instrument those and monitor them. And uh, even if you're using the analytics stacks that they provide or the capabilities in, in those and technologies, you, you have, you know, they have different frameworks or different languages or different approaches. So if you look at the, uh, a knock or an operator in a, a typical command center, you know, they're not going to necessarily have the deep skills uh, of, of a data scientist or, um, uh, or, or some, you know, a, a statistician or a mathematician to, to build models or to tweak models of, of the analytics you might be using to, to get the value. So from a vendor perspective, you know, we look at this as an opportunity to make, uh, to introduce uh, analytic capabilities in these spaces that are more turnkey based on the use cases, the typical use cases of that hybrid IT, uh, you know, the use case or scenario. Um, other things that, uh, areas that I think is a people changer is um, for the manager and being able to, so you mentioned arbitraging cloud. We see that today as when the customers we talk to, you know, multi-cloud environment, which cloud vendor do I want to put which workloads or which components or production versus non-production or if I need to burst either expected or unexpectedly. Being able to manage the cost of that and understand where my costs are for the value I'm getting of my, my microservices or my, my digital components is really important because that will drive decisions of how I arbitrage my, my cloud environment. And again, as a vendor, we're building in uh, those capabilities to measure those types of things to, to help with, with uh, you know, close those gaps of, of, of skill sets that are needed for driving optimization in, the, in a hybrid IT <coughs> uh, operations. Andrash, how do you see that people and process side of the equation? Uh, do we need to reinvent IT operations 
for the cloud era when it comes to being able to uh, react quickly, do the economic uh, imperative of the right cloud model at the right time in the right place. Um, that that uh, definitely is a question that we're tackling in the industry right now. There's this realization that most people have either gone to the lift and shift to you know realize value in the cloud, or they've done relatively low-hanging, innovative um, kind of activities, and they're learning about what it means to maintain you know solutions in the cloud, uh, but early in the industry about DevOps um, and all the other experiences and the, uh, that, that were necessary in order to make that transformation to continuous roll forward. And if you don't know what continuous roll forward is, that is you might have uh, a, a microservice application and multiple components of it are at different levels and you're able to actually canary certain components of it that is tested out on the end users and do statistics and an ana analysis on them. So it's generating all sorts of big data for you. But all of that requires a level of sophistication and maturity um, that, that is necessary, that only comes from learning all of these other things. And we finally realized that DevOps and Sec DevOps is really the last stage in the cloud transformation, not the first. Mm. Gary, you mentioned that it's spotty, that we can get some data in some places, but not others. We also know that we have a legacy environment that's still running and that we're gathering insights and management uh, capabilities from that. We also know that the amount of cloud adoption is, is skyrocketing, it's going up very rapidly. Do we need to move beyond this idea of islands of management and come up to a comprehensive meta level when it comes to having insight with common uh, variables, common metrics across all of those different places? That is to say, uh, can I really accurately manage my on-premises legacy along with my SaaS applications, along with data uh, and backup and recovery services. It, it seems to me that having those in different islands won't suffice, that in order to get the real benefit of a comprehensive pan cloud environment, I have to have pan cloud management. Uh, is that where we're heading and is that where vendors like yours are, are trying to, to go to give that full comprehensive view, one throat to choke even uh, regardless of where the workloads and data uh, are residing or the services uh, are residing? Yeah, so definitely the, the objective is to have a, a cross-domain view of all the dependencies of your digital services as you put into the cloud. Um, a common metadata model or a common standard of defining things um, in my opinion, I think it is probably unrealistic. I think there might be some pockets, uh, but given the veracity of, of, of uh, vendors and technologies and, and, um, uh, and open source in this space, um, that's gonna be a, a long, uh, you know, a pretty long journey it, with a standard route. I think um, more realistic uh, would be and I think it is, is playing out uh, in probably early stages is where analytics uh, can do some inference. Um, so things like understanding uh, dependency mappings and inferring things. So you know, today we do this very well in cloud and on-prem through discovery and through types of monitoring where we, things that we monitor, we can bring that back and piece it together, even if it spans multiple clouds or on-prem and, and, and cloud, so that hybrid model. Um, but even that, it still requires, it's still deterministic to, to some degree. You still have to define it. You, have, you still have to have um, certain um, uh, levels of, of access to, to get uh, all, all the, the data points and, and show those relationships. But when you, it, it, I think the focus is, is uh, turning towards, you know, collect data, and then once you have the data, the cross, ref, the cross domain representation, then we can apply analytics on top of that, that can uh, do that sort of that unsupervised machine learning where you don't need to know labels, you don't need to know things in advance, but you can infer those and understand, uh, infer relationships or dependency models. And I think that, while it won't be perfect, it will accommodate the, the, the dynamic aspect of cloud and, and with the, just the variety and veracity of different um, you know, 
standards and technologies and you know even within a company you know we call this field this but it means that we call this field there's the same 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 field same meaning but it, it or same field but with a different meaning you know and if you're trying to assimilate those for something you know it, it, it's it, it's going to be difficult trying to force a standard mm. so it sounds like waiting for the management console to rule them all might not be the way to go or to wait for a standard to evolve that everyone can adhere to might not be the way to go but if you can get all the data and you can analyze that then the analysis of the data about your operations across all of these different variables in itself becomes a management console or capability I, is that where we're heading that it, the the analytics of IT as uh, a service universe becomes the way in order to not only monitor it but to begin to proactively manage it and optimize it yeah I mean absolutely in fact that's where the um I don't know if that question was for me, but I, I wanted yeah, to respond please. to it because that's exactly, uh, the, it, it is a management console, but, but more than just a traditional management console, it's, it becomes a, um, you know, a so, sort of a, a, a data lake where you can then, you, you can provide analytics that drives automation, that drives new insights that you can't just get with, with a, a management console. Um, so so it's, it's a combination of the data, I wouldn't say all the data, but the, the right amount of data, because you don't want to turn a data lake into a data swamp, but then using that data uh, through things like inferred topology uh, or inferred relationships to, to really begin to take the work out of the system and optimize things for, mm -hmm. for that operations team. <coughs> so Andres, that brings us back to our initial premise that IT maybe needs to start using an analytics and big data and uh, cross-platform uh, Uber data, metadata an analysis to start getting a handle on this, which then brings us to this concept of artificial intelligence operations, where we're not just using traditional analytics, but we might be asking algorithms to start playing a role and learning from all of the systems uh, and behaviors of cloud and public cloud and private cloud and legacy to start giving us a proactive approach, more automation, letting the machines run the machines. Is that where we're going in your, in your opinion, Andrush? Um, I don't think it's going to be a roll your own kind of thing. I think the platform itself is the, the vendors are going to come up with a certain set of standards and, da and there's going to be a series of dashboards, not just one, but a uh, kind of a hierarchy of, of management capabilities which uh, are going to be visual in nature that's going to show how your, your s solutions and your microservices are operating across uh, their domains and within their containers. And it's just way too difficult, too complex for you as an end user to build this stuff yourself, and you don't want to be in the business of that e anyway. Um, I definitely believe the whole reason why we're talking about AI, and you know, could just a you know a real quick uh, personal view of the world. I, I went to graduate school. My major what my major concentration was. In, in AI and operating systems, and I was also the university statistician, and that's how I got my way through the you know, university. And I feel like it, we're coming full circle. While, we, while, while I didn't really use AI for a number of years, it wasn't until the cloud came around um, that allowed us to have the massive amount of storage and connectivity and compute power and, and then you had this uh, OP3, you know, convergence, the, the, the third wave come, uh, and mo mobile devices that generated all of this information that made it easier for us to implement, um, you know, collect, manage, organize, assess, and uh, understand the bias, and then actually build AI applications. Without the cloud, there will be no AI. So absolutely, the cloud plays a huge role in that. Um, but it, you know, from a build it, manage it kind of stuff, um, if you have to do that, then I think we failed as CSPs. And uh, furthermore, you would have to put all of your resources into you know, technical debt, uh, building infrastructure that you would have to throw away later on. So hopefully we get to that point where you don't have to do that. You're focused on the business value of getting that data, analyzing it, and putting into those AI services. So AWS comes up with an AI service, and Gary, you help companies gather all the data that they have about their AI, uh, their, um, their IT rather, plug it into that, and then you can help, uh, you can have AWS help you out to figure out how to subvert AWS cost structures. Sure. Sure. <laughs>
Uh, do you have any examples before we go to our Q&A of where you're starting to see real cross-organizational models of you know, cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud management and helping organizations then um, optimize their spend when it comes to cloud? Do, are we there yet? Are we still in the figuring out what we have in place? Uh, have we moved past the point of taking inventory and stock past shadow IT and then uh, starting to actually do management and optimization? Where are we on that in, in terms of sort of a general lay of the land in the industry? Well, you know, we do have, uh, there are several vendors with offerings. In fact, we have one for multi-cloud management governance that started off as Graviton and has been, this is like four years ago that we bought that company. And it's really about the policy management for m managing across the clouds, understanding the cost of what your, what your projected cost will be if you move the workload from one place to the next. You know, underneath of that, there's multi-cloud management where you're moving things around, you're building actual microservice-based applications. So I do think that's a really in important distinction between the two. That makes it a lot easier. I mean, if you're an organization that wants to restrict the use of some services on any one of the particular clouds, that's the layer that you have to implement. And you're not gonna be building that yourself. You're gonna be probably bringing in one of these tools because otherwise, again, you're investing in things that aren't high value from your business point of view. Mm -hmm. Gary, examples of where this yeah. is working or where we are on the progression towards uh, real automation? Yeah, so uh, in MicroFocus, um, we have uh, you know, different offerings. Um, we have, uh, depending, depending on where in the life cycle you are, so we have uh, the ability to, um, we have products that look at your on-prem ecosystem and, and kind of rate or characterize which ones are best, uh, fit, uh, best fit for a cloud application and then actually do a, a migration for you to a, a public cloud. Uh, and we also have products that actually manage that cloud, uh, or hi that hybrid cloud environment for you. Uh, that's kind of the, I guess, migration if you're not building new. Then we also, a lot of our customers are MSPs, and they themselves provide services in the cloud to, to their uh, customers. So they use a lot of our products to manage uh, their, their services that they're providing. And uh, so many of the things that we already talked about, you know, being able to optimize the, their costs and optimize their, their service offerings for efficiencies. Um, and in many cases, they're pulling data uh, and centralizing that into our, in, in, into our uh, data lake um, that, that then they're using analytics to, to get those insights into and to drive uh, certain automation. Um, and you know, it's also part of monitoring. So it sort of becomes full circle for some of our MSPs where they're taking the insights that they learn from, um, for, from the analytics of logs and events and optimizing their monitoring policies of basically what they look at to help uh, to get those efficiencies. So those are, you know, th that's happening today. Um, the level of automation, I think, is is still, a, you know, an opportunity area uh, in this whole in this whole market. Uh, but you know, there are some um, some organizations making some progress there. Andrash, last uh, to you, uh, example use case of, of where this is working now, where organizations are in fact moving toward a comprehensive management and optimization of their IT operations. Well, I mean, if you're asking me from an IBM point of view, American Airlines, uh, Harley Davidson, uh, you know, they're, you know, Harley Davidson really was thinking in terms of how do we actually build the next genera generation bikes? Because, you know, there's just not, not enough hell angels around left anymore to drive their revenue. So they're looking at, at um, you know, electric uh, motorcycles and, and connected motorcycles and all sorts of neat things. They really had to transform their entire business and that means, you know, getting as much of their IT infrastructure into the cloud, and then that really isn't just the starting point because the point of getting things into the cloud for them was not about optimization; it was about the, the ability then to be to apply the uh, prescriptive, descriptive, descriptive, prescriptive, and then AI uh, capabilities that a data science would be able to need access to, in order to gain insight into how to shift their business, for example. Because in a digital business, in a digital transformation mode, you're not gonna just use these analytics to run your IT ops, you're gonna use it to run your business because your business is the IT ops. Right. 
All right, we're going to go to questions. If you have any, please um, add them to Slido, but um, I'll go to our first question. It says, a speaker at the previous event uh, answered the question on a, a different way, saying, friends don't let friends do hybrid cloud. So are we saying that we can actually analyze the data so that friends would let friends do hybrid cloud? Is, is, that, is that a person who works for a CSP who said that <laughs> and just wants their stuff on their cloud? The fact of the matter is, statistics show us that you know, only about 20% of workloads move. Majority of what's gonna move uh, is gonna move either via hybrid cloud or staged via hybrid cloud or within hybrid cloud. That is, that is a fact. That technology is where everybody's focused. Every single CSP and vendor is focused there uh, right now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the idea that hybrid cloud is, is not going to be supported or easy, that's just simply not true. Gary, uh, yeah. do we have enough data in monitoring to do hybrid cloud very well? Yeah, I, we absolutely do. Um, in, in fact, I, I, this uh, a comment that uh, Andres made is the, um, there's, there's always gonna be you know, workloads that are going to be they're going to stay on-prem either because of um, regulations or privacy or uh, sensitivity. So I, I, don't, I don't think we're ever going to not have or not see uh, organizations that, that don't have some presence there. I, I think it's really going to be a matter of optimizing cost. Um, and, you know, cloud, uh, you know, vendors have a lot of, uh, cloud vendors have a lot of uh, capabilities and services today, but, um, you know, our customers already tell us, you know, one of the reasons they do multi-cloud is to arbitrage the, the costs. And, and um, you know, what vendors like, like Microsoft do is, um, you know, we, we, are, we are trying to be an abstraction layer. So we will, you know, go ahead and use that cloud vendor's tools if you want, and we will, you know, integrate with it and give you more of a holistic view because a lot of times the, the tools that you're using in a cloud are only, um, in the realm of the cloud and not the full, that full digital service scope, uh, which again, I go back to, you know, what are you trying to measure, either from an SLA or from your, dig, your, your, your user experience? Does it live and die in that cloud? You know, great, then, then go with that. But if it, if it spans beyond that, you know, how, how, are you gonna, how are you gonna piece it together to have meaningful end-to-end -end or, you know, that cross-domain view of performance, of health, of, you know, the, the, the delivery of that, of that cloud mm -hmm. uh, service. So. <coughs> and, and by the way, Dana, I think in the second act of cloud, which is where we're hitting right now, uh, we're gonna be back to selecting cloud vendors and capability based on what they do, what, they, what services they provide that's unique and necessary for our business capability. It's not gonna come from all of one, uh, and you're gonna have to be able to manage across multiple vendors. A bit more specialization, perhaps. I, you know, just look at the difference between Amazon, you know, not to even talk about IBM Cloud, because if you list, look at Amazon and Azure, you can see the difference between what business value Microsoft is bringing versus Amazon. And certainly from an IBM point of view, we're, we're all about big data, data science, and AI. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question from Ron Schult. Uh, I want to avoid cloud vendor lock-in. What key steps should I take before committing to the first cloud vendor? So the question is, how do you use data and analytics to prevent lock-in? Yeah, I mean, it, if you, um, so <laughs> we sell monitoring, we sell data, data collection, right? So, so there's a lot of vendors out there who provide, outside of you know, cloud native, are gonna provide you know, deep connectivity, deep, uh, connection and, and being able to monitor and collect data independently from a cloud or working natively with the cloud. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of technology out there on the operational side uh, to instrument your cloud, either, you know, in, in, in multiple fashions, agent, agentless, um, through APIs, through, you know, different, different mechanisms to, to get level of coverage and different depths of coverage that is completely independent from, from the cloud uh, that, you, that you choose to deploy on. So, you know, there are paths forward for that. Andrash, how do we avoid luck in using more intelligence and data? So, so, Dana, I think I've been on stage with you before where I've told you that I am not a huge fan of this concept of lock-in because anytime you make a decision about a, a vendor's, you know, horse you're gonna ride with any particular vendor, you've locked yourself in to a certain degree from an experience point of view and, 
and a long-term service point of view. Uh, regardless, what you do need to be focused on is your ability to pivot in the next stage. So if you take an SAP application and you move it onto one cloud, are you able to take that environment and move it somewhere else, even if it's back to your hybrid cloud environment, without incurring huge costs or being built on top of a very proprietary set of interfaces. Though, so openness is really the question at hand. You need an exit strategy and knowing what you've got and how it's running and where might be a good And, and built on open standards. Mm -hmm. All right, last question, we're about out of time. Uh, Andras, you mentioned digital architecture. Uh, can you say a bit more about what that means in practice for an enterprise architect? Yeah, well, I think we're just beginning to understand that. Well, we're tackling that certainly within the open group. But I think it's applying uh, new capabilities or, or new techniques, shall I say, like design thinking, outside in, agile. So looking at how you actually develop your solutions from an end user point of view um, and creating personas and doing it you know, incrementally um, instead of kind of using a giant waterfall model um, and thinking of it from the IT world. Everything that is digital transformation is done from the business value in. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. How about a round of applause uh, for our panel? We've been here with Gary Brandt, Senior Product Manager at Microfocus, and Andras Sakal. Uh, he's the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at IBM Federal. Thank you so much.